So what I'd like to cover are the following four points. First of all, how do drugs distribute into mucosal tissues, because that's what we're interested in terms of HIV prevention uh, for the most part. What influences drug distribution um, into mucosal tissues? Do tissue concentrations actually influence the effectiveness of prevention agents, and can tissue concentrations be used to understand um, PKPD early in the development process so that we can optimize therapy? So my laboratory became very interested in um, HIV prevention as we started to learn more about the early events in HIV infection. And this is a cartoon that um, was adapted uh, from Ashley Haas's paper um, by Tony Fauci and presented at a World AIDS conference a number of years ago, which shows uh, HIV um, crossing the epithelial barrier through the lamina propria, um, getting into the stroma, either on its own or uh, facilitated by dendritic cells and um, uh, activated CD4 T cells um, involved in early infection. And although infectio infectious, the infectious process continues um, into regional lymph nodes where a viral reservoir is established, we were particularly interested in this activated CD4 positive T cell that was also alpha 4 beta 7 positive and so it was a migratory cell um, and whether we could find target concentrations that would actually abort infection in this particular place in the stroma. Now we did know through a series of animal experiments that there is a dose response relationship in HIV prevention. And I'm gonna show you some data now on tenofovir specifically because tenofovir has been investigated the most and the longest um, for prevention strategies. And these are macaque data uh, with tenofovir given systemically either orally or subcutaneously um, with or without FTC. And what I've done here is I'm normalizing the exposure in the animals to uh, human plasma equivalents. So there are some doses in animals that were given such that the animals received very large plasma exposures, unsustainable in animals and certainly unsustainable in people. And then there were some regimens that were given to animals where exposures were similar to humans, maybe a little bit higher, and then some um, where there was uh, a very limited exposure, lower exposure than we would see in humans. And so whether we see uh, a vaginal challenge or a rectal challenge, oral challenge or IV challenge, when the drug exposure, plasma drug exposure of tenofovir is very high, um, we see full protection. And then when we move to lower doses with rectal challenge, we see partial protection in the animals. And then when we move to even lower doses with an oral challenge, we see no protection. So certainly there was a dose response relationship for prevention for tenofovir, but we didn't really have any data on clinical scaling of that. We couldn't necessarily use plasma concentrations because again, those very high concentrations were just untenable. So we wanted to understand whether there's a concentration response relationship, particularly in the mucosa, that could help guide dosing strategies and um, interspecies scaling. Now we do know one thing, um, particularly from antibiotics, that tissue distribution is very heterogeneous. Um, back in 2004, uh, Mueller um, published some data in AAC on um, labeled uh, trovofloxacin and PET scanning of trovofloxacin. And here you can see various organs and uh, high concentrations of trovofloxacin in red and low concentrations in white or in blue. And what we see is very large variability within one patient, within a particular tissue in terms of concentration and also between tissues. So there's high intra-tissue variability, there's high inter-tissue variability, and there's also high in intersubject variability. So the target site concentrations, if we're looking at places where uh, HIV infection may be established, that might be very different from plasma concentrations. Recently, Corbin Thompson, a graduate student in my laboratory, published some data using mass spec imaging of efavirenz in non-human primates and evaluating exposure across different tissues in the NHP model. And this is an example of that with high efavirenz concentrations 
um, uh, identified in yellow and in white, and low concentrations identified in red or in black. And so you can see in a cross-section of uh, colorectal tissue of a non-human primate dosed with the favarins, there's also heterogeneous distribution. So we know this for antibiotics. We also see this for antiretrovirals. So what my lab did was first to understand this exposure of mucosal surfaces and just to look at whether we see differences um, with antiretrovirals in terms of exposure um, between uh, cervical and vaginal tissue and colorectal tissue. And this is a summary of those data. These are divided in columns by therapeutic class, and these exposures are typically AUC exposures, and they're normalized for blood plasma concentrations. So they're normalized for systemic exposure. And so anything that lines, lies along that red line of one means that the tissue concentration, or in some cases, the cervical vaginal fluid concentration, is equal to that of blood plasma. Anything above that line means that the drug is concentrating in higher amounts in um, the mucosa than it is in plasma, and anything below that line means that the concentrations are lower than in plasma. And so we see a number of things. Um, first of all, just within a drug class, in pink are female genital tract concentrations, you can see highly variable um, penetration of drugs. So even within one drug class, we see very different um, extents of penetration of the drug. And then if you compare the pink um, squares, which are female genital tract, to the blue squares, which are colorectal tissue, you can see in general that drug penetration into the female genital tract is lower than what we see in colorectal tissue. And this, I know the question was raised about um, fecal uh, elimination of drug and the topical effect of the drug against colorectal tissue. And um, that may absolutely play a role in what we see here, although we don't see this wouldn't be a result of fecal contamination because we wipe the gut clean of that before we do any sampling. But we also see with IV drugs in animals that drug tends to concentrate in colorectal tissue very quickly. So there's also um, a biological effect without even having um, the oral formulation being dosed. So what influences uh, drug distributions in tissues? So at least in mucosal tissues, we don't have a good handle on that yet. This is a cartoon that was published by Lisa Rohan's group last year, evaluating drug transporters or providing a summary of drug transporters along the female genital tract, moving from vagina to uh, ectocervix to endocervix, and there being different um, uh, rates or different amounts of expression along um, that tract. In addition, there's also um, drug transporters on the venous uh, endothelium. Corbin Thompson, again, a few years ago, published some data on trying to understand what the predictors of drug exposure were in the female genital tract, and he used a chemi-informatics approach where he combed the literature and found information on 58 drugs that uh, fell into 13 drug classes. And with that information, he evaluated what could possibly predict higher exposure in the female genital tract. And what he found was that there was higher female genital tract penetration of these drugs if there was a higher volume of distribution, which makes sense. If the uh, substrate was likely, if the drug was likely a substrate for MRP1, if it was not likely a substrate for MRP4, and potentially if there was lower protein binding, although um, the model didn't reach significance with that particular parameter. Using those, um, uh, using those characteristics, um, he did evaluate the penetration of rilpivirine and dolutegravir, which was not included in the original data set, and did find that the model predicted the penetration, the penetration of rilpivirine and dolutegravir in the female genital tract. However, we just don't have enough data to develop a complete model to understand the, uh, what predicts high drug penetration in mucosal sites. But the big question is, do tissue concentrations matter? So I'm going to show you some data that we generated from Caprisa 004, which was the first study to evaluate a topical product, tenofovir 1% gel, um, in women uh, to protect them from HIV infection. And what we have on the left-hand uh, left side of the slide 
is the individuals who were infected in relation to the concentrations of tenofovir in the vagina that increases from left to right. And so as you increase the concentration of tenofovir in the vaginal cavity, you decrease the uh, likelihood of the number of women infected. Now this was um, a, uh, a case control analysis post hoc, and so the numbers are very small, um, but we do see some sort of a relationship. That relationship also seems to hold when we look at HSV2 infection. So on the right-hand side of the slide, you're seeing that same uh, graphic, but now we're looking at HSV2 infection and the probability of HSV2 infection declines as you increase tenofovir concentrations in the female genital tract. And that, um, uh, that blue bar represents the in vitro EC50 for HSV2 with tenofovir. Tenofovir can't be used for HSV2 because the concentrations are very low. Um, but when you actually use a topical formulation where your original exposure is a million nanograms per mil, the EC50 is actually 10,000 nanograms per mil, and that is achievable with topical dosing. Now, the one thing I want to focus on is this concentration here of 1,000 nanograms per mil. At about 1,000 nanograms per mil, at least in this post hoc analysis, we saw about 50% protection um, uh, against HIV. So if we look at the Caprisa 004 data another way, um, we can evaluate over time on study what the probability of HIV infection was. And so in the uh, red line, this is the placebo gel. In the blue line is those women who were assigned to nofavir gel, but their exposures were less than 1,000 nanograms per mil. And then in the green line are those individuals who were given tenofovir gel whose concentrations were greater than 1,000 nanograms per mil. And this is where we saw the largest effect of tenofovir gel with about a 50% decline in infection rate. And we were not allowed to sample these women, um, biopsy these women while they were on study because that could potentially increase their risk of HIV infection. But we did look at these women afterwards and tried to evaluate what the relationship was between tenofovir exposure in the vaginal cavity and tenofovir diphosphate uh, exposure in mucosal tissue. And this 1,000 nanograms per mil results in about 500 femtomoles of tenofovir diphosphate per milligram of tissue. When we look at in vitro systems with an, uh, an explant model and evaluate the efficacy of tenofovir in an explant model, we also see an EC50 of approximately 7,000 femtomoles per milligram. So it seems like, at least for topical products, what we're seeing in the explant uh, seems to be related to what we're seeing clinically. Now we also have some data from David Katz at Duke who uses Raman spectroscopy which is a very nifty technique to evaluate drug concentrations through layers of thickness of tissue um, in real time. And so he can use his uh, Raman equipment to measure exposure over time after topical application of a product. And so what you have on the left is a cross-section of mucosal tissue uh, with epithelium about 100 microns down and then stroma further down from that. And what I want you to focus on on the right is just the green line for now, where 60 minutes after the application of tenofovir gel, you can see fairly high exposure in the epithelium. And then that declines fairly quickly um, as you move through the layers of the mucosa so that by the time you reach about halfway through the stroma, your concentrations are quite low. So when you have a topical product, that exposure of the active compound in that topical pro product drops precipitously over time. And we also know that from just measuring plasma concentrations of any compound that's applied topically is that we see those concentrations are quite a bit lower. So David has also modeled um, depivirine exposures, and the same thing happens with depivirine, where those concentrations drop precipitously um, across the stroma. We do have some recent data from depivirine in uh, uh, ring formulation, both the ring study and the Aspire study, demonstrating about a 30% efficacy rate of uh, depivirine in the ring. And that relates to a similar proportion of protection in Caprisa 004 with the gel um, of about 
efficacy. Now this is quite a bit different from what we see for Truvada, tenofovir plus FTC, where, exposure, where um, when exposures are good in individuals who are taking the drug regularly, we see very high rates of protection. And it may be that different formulations are actually protecting differently. So if we have a topical product, we see concentrations are dropping pretty rapidly over time, and perhaps they're not actually achieving um, it, it very much exposure in regional lymph nodes, so maybe we're only catching half of, um, of what we need to protect in order for full efficacy. And if we dose systemically, whether the concentrations of drug uh, decrease um, across the mucosal surface or whether the concentrations of drug increase across the mucosal surface, maybe it is that we're covering more areas that really need to be protected from HIV infection. However, this is still more theoretical, and we don't really know exactly where we uh, need to be in terms of drug concentration to abort all uh, exposure to HIV. Nonetheless, uh, my laboratory decided to evaluate whether we could use mucosal tissue concentrations with systemic therapy with Truvada to understand um, dosing strategies in individuals at risk for HIV. And so these are some data that were generated for tenofovir diphosphate on the left and FTC triphosphate in the right uh, in mucosal tissues. Female genital tract tissues are in pink. We combined those because we found that vaginal tissue concentrations and cervical tissue concentrations were very similar. Um, and then uh, colorectal tissue concentrations in blue. And we see very different penetration um, with each of these compounds. So tenofovir diphosphate exposure becomes quite high and is prolonged in colorectal tissue after a single dose of Truvada. And the converse is true for FTC triphosphate, where female genital tract concentrations are very high compared to colorectal tissue, but all of those concentrations are pretty much below the limit of quantitation 72 hours after a dose. Now those were um, data that were generated from tissue biopsy homogenates, and as you heard from Mackenzie earlier today, there is a significant degree of heterogeneity in the composition of tissue biopsies. So whether you're looking at columnar epithelium or whether you're looking at stratified epithelium, you not only have um, epithelial cells, and then in the stroma you have multiple cell types as well. So the question of whether we can use biopsies as a surrogate for CD4 positive cells uh, was still a question. Luckily, MTN006 did a very nice study where they evaluated tenofovir diphosphate concentrations both in tissue homogenates and also in isolated CD4 positive cells from um, uh, those same individuals. And they found that there was a fairly decent relationship between concentrations of tenofovir diphosphate in isolated mucosal mononuclear cells and uh, tissue biopsies. And so we felt fairly comfortable using tissue biopsy uh, homogenate data as a way to um, move modeling forward. And so we did generate a model in order to predict tenofovir diphosphate and FTC triphosphate concentrations in mucosal tissues with varying doses. And this is just one example of that after the first 10 doses of Truvada and the concentrations in lower female genital tract tissue and concentrations in rectal tissue. The dashed lines that are horizontal are where those trough concentrations, those steady state trough concentrations actually lie. And so you can see for lower female genital tract tissue, steady state concentrations are achieved within about two or three doses. And then for rectal tissue, steady state exposure is achieved in about six to nine, but those rectal tissue concentrations again um, uh, seem to be much higher for tenofovir diphosphate uh, than they are for female genital tract. And you can see that here in terms of the differences in concentrations between the two and also the opposite for FTC. <laughs> One thing that we were very intrigued at was this issue of uh, endogenous nucleotides. Do endogenous factors matter with respect to Truvada? Um, we did find some data from the CDC that were published in 2011 that demonstrated a high reversion of tenofovir diphosphate reverse transcriptase inhibition when you had higher DATP exposure. So as DATP exposure increased, tenofovir activity decreased. So we decided to look at these endogenous nucleotides in our tissues as well. 
And so we have DATP in the middle, and then we have DCTP on the right. And we have cervical tissue, vaginal tissue, and rectal tissue. And we were expecting rectal tissue to have higher amounts of DATP and DCTP just because of the inflammatory state. But we found that, these, uh, that this tissue actually had lower concentrations of endogenous nucleotides, which could also make sense because the female genital tract is also in a state of inflammation. So when we, instead of just measuring the drug concentration, if we combine the drug concentration or the active concentration of the drug along with uh, its paired endogenous nucleotide, this is what we see over the first 10 doses. And now I have tenofovir diphosphate on the left and FTC triphosphate on the right, so you can compare those two tissues over time. And what we see when we add in the DATP is the difference in uh, tenofovir exposure, or those exposure ratios actually increase um, in colorectal tissue compared to the female genital tract, whereas the FTC exposures, those ratios actually start to overlap. So the main difference uh, in what we're seeing is really uh, mainly focused on tenofovir. So we had some decent PK information that we could use to model, but now we needed PD information. And unfortunately in prevention, we don't really have efficacy targets that have been identified. So what um, Mackenzie Cottrell did was she isolated CD4 positive cells, she put them into culture, and she evaluated uh, um, the uh, uh, relationship between uh, tenofovir diphosphate to DATP ratio and FTC triphosphate to DCTP ratio um, and th the ability to inhibit HIV infection in these cells. What we then did was some synergy modeling and so you can see a surface model here on the right hand side with the FTC um, uh, alone concentrations, uh, concentration response relationship on the left, the tenofovir diphosphate concentration response relationship on the right, and then we uh, uh, evaluated a few combinations of tenofovir and FTC in order to generate a surface model in order to understand whether there was synergy or whether there was additivity in the system. And when we did that, uh, we found that the psi value was 0.6, so anything less than one was considered synergistic. We also evaluated that effect uh, using a median effects model and the chu talale model, and they both showed synergy as well. So we included um, the EC90s from these ratios along with the synergy term to come up with the um, target concentration that we were aiming for in mucosal tissues. When we did that, this is what we found. We modeled doses of drug once a week, twice a week, three, four, five, six, and seven times a week in both the female genital tract and the lower gastrointestinal tract. And we identified the proportion of the population was achieving that target exposure that we had identified. And what we saw was that in the female genital tract, in order for 100% of the population to achieve the target exposure, it would require a daily dose of Truvada, whereas in the lower gastrointestinal tract, it would only require a couple doses of Truvada a week. We also evaluated the Ipergay dosing strategy, which is um, a double dose of, uh, of Truvada before coitus, and then a dose 24 and 48 hours after coitus. And if you just look at the dashed lines, that's the Truvada um, dosing with, uh, um, with the proportion who are achieving the target concentration. And we can see a couple things. There are, at the very beginning of that dosing strategy, approximately 100% of the population, whether it's um, colorectal tissue or whether it's female genital tract tissue, achieve that target exposure. The problem is over time. By 72 hours, the proportion of the population who are achieving the target exposure in the female genital tract decline fairly quickly, whereas colorectal tissue, the proportion who achieve that target exposure, um, uh, stay, stays fairly consistent for multiple days after. What we don't know is what the coverage of antiretrovirals needs to be after um, uh, exposure to HIV in order to confer full protection. Um, we think it's uh, likely at least a week, but we don't know for certain. So if that is the case, 
if women are using this product intermittently and they need that exposure uh, uh, way far out after um, coitus has actually happened, then there may be some differences in efficacy here with coitally dependent strategies. So we believe we've been able to model these data and explain some clinical trials outcomes. Um, Pete Anderson has done a very elegant job of looking at uh, the IPREC study, which was a study of Truvada in MSM, which had 44% efficacy overall. And the majority of those subjects seem to be taking two to four doses a week, some were taking more. Um, but what he did is he modeled the exposure of tenofovir diphosphate in PBMCs at two, four, and seven doses per week and compared that to HIV incidence. And what he found was in the MSM population that there was um, uh, a significant decline in HIV incidence or predicted HIV incidence with two doses of Truvada per week in the MSM population. So when we look at the FEMPREP study, which was the same Truvada strategy using daily dosing, but in women, there was no efficacy noted. When we looked at women and their adherence on a monthly basis over a, a 12 week, uh, 12, uh, 12 month period of time over a year, we saw that in general, 40 to 60 percent of these women were taking two doses of Truvada or more, but we saw very different efficacy results, and we think we've been able to explain some of that by um, using the tissue concentrations and the differential distribution of these drugs in colorectal tissue compared to female genital tract um, uh, for a likely explanation. So in summary, in terms of uh, PKPD for prevention, we know that drug distribution in mucosal tissues is heterogeneous, and we think this is because of drug transporters, volume of distribution, protein binding, and other things that are still as yet unknown. We don't have a definitive predictive model yet, uh, primarily because of lack of clinical tissue PK data. If we had very large data sets, we could probably use the chemi-informatics approach and come up with some um, reasonably predictive models. So that is still a work in progress. One caveat is that there is not one consistent marker of PrEP efficacy that has been defined yet. We don't exactly know where the drug needs to be. For complete protection, we don't know if mucosal tissues are enough based on topical PrEP. It looks like it may not be. Um, we don't know if it's the regional lymph node concentrations that are needed. And that different uh, um, concentration of tenofovir diphosphate in TAF versus TDF, that may help explain, um, uh, or that may help us understand a little better where those concentrations actually need to be. But I do think tissue concentrations might be useful in defining dosing strategies or identifying product limitations. For topical dosing, I think absolutely the tissue concentrations link to efficacy. For oral dosing, I think the tissue concentrations are a surrogate of protective areas, especially if there's a difference in distribution between different mucosal tissues. If mucosal tissue concentrations are similar, for example, for cabotegravir, very similar concentrations between colorectal tissue and the female genital tract, then plasma data may be a good surrogate. So I don't think the tissue concentrations themselves um, are sort of a be-all and end-all to uh, understanding prevention PKPD. But I do think we can use um, this type of approach to enhance our clinical trial design. I don't need to tell this audience that we use these types of uh, modeling approaches to optimize study design, um, to understand the types of dosing we need to use in organ impairment in special populations, pediatrics and pregnancy. Um, and I think uh, we could certainly um, spend a, a little bit of effort, a little bit of resources in doing that up front so that we uh, aren't surprised um, in phase three. I'd like to acknowledge those members of my laboratory who contributed to the data that I presented today, also our UNC School of Medicine collaborators, um, our funding sources, and also um, our uh, uh, pharma and global collaborators on this work. Thank you.